We're going on assignment with the Voice of America. How has it been like covering the event? And I have a list right here in front of me of all the journalists who are beaten. I make the call because I'm on the ground. The Chechen. Gabe Joslo, VOA News, Mogadishu. Coming up on assignment, a tense standoff between Russia and Ukraine. We have background and analysis from Voice of America's Ukrainian service. Welcome to the program. With us now is Miroslava Gongadze from VOA's Ukrainian service. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Miroslava is here to talk about uh, the tensions between Ukraine and uh, Russia right now. Yeah, this of course comes after Russian forces entered Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. And with Russia saying it's protecting its citizens and Western nations defending Ukraine's sovereignty, the Crimea crisis has escalated into the most serious confrontation between Russia and the West since the Cold War. Now, Miroslava, what's at the root of this conflict? Why is Crimea so important? First of all, I think uh, it's important to understand that uh, Russian aggression or Ru Russian military moves is not uh, um, some kind of uh, uh, mission to to save uh, Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainians or a Russian-speaking population in Crimea. It's a, a clear violation of international law because Ukraine um, gave up its nuclear weapons in 1994 in exchange of uh, protection from uh, United States, uh, England and Russia uh, agreeing to protect Ukrainian sovereignty. Right now, uh, Russia clearly violated that, that agreement and many other agreements that were made between Ukraine and Russia and force um, themselves uh, on, on the area. The Crimea Peninsula is the part of, is in the Black Sea and uh, we have to understand that around the Black Sea we have three NATO members, member countries. So I don't think that United States or a NATO ally, ally, alliance uh, can um, can um, let themselves uh, that, uh, let uh, Putin make Black Sea uh, Putin Putin's lake because it's mm. a very dangerous situation. So it's strategic strategic um, area for NATO members and for Russia as well. Definitely for Ukraine. But some of the critics are also saying that this started when uh, the now ousted president, uh, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, rejected a deal with closer ties uh, with Russia. Do you think... Uh, it was actually with, with the with, EU. With yeah. EU uh, having to have closer ties with Russia. Do you think it has anything to do with that? No, absolutely, because it started with, uh, with Ukrainian uh, peaceful protesting that um, uh, that decision that uh, President Yanukovych made, he, he, in the last moment, he decided to switch sides and decided to uh, move uh, toward Russia and uh, uh, decided not to sign agreement with the uh, European Union. Ukrainians were very disappointed because they were hoping that Ukraine can become a democratic country and can introduce some reforms that they were uh, waiting for so long. So it didn't happen and for three months Ukrainians were standing on Maidan and we know now how uh, brutal um, Ukrainian uh, forces, Yanukovych forces uh, were uh, toward people. So almost 100 people died and thousands uh, were beaten, tortured. Uh, so uh, President Yanukovych left the country. He abandoned the country. He uh, picked pick up his belongings and left. Uh, now we know that he is in uh, Russia. But yes, Ukraine, Ukraine wants to be with Europe. There was a clear, uh, clear uh, decision by Ukrainian people. Now Ukraine has a new government that, uh, that is trying to move Ukraine toward Europe. That's what Russia is disappointed with and don't like. And that's what they're mingling in Ukrainian, in Ukrainian affairs. And Miroslav, on a personal note, what's it like for you covering this situation as a Ukrainian yourself, but also needing to balance your role as a journalist? It's hard. It's hard uh, because it's, uh, I mean, I have all my loved ones there, uh, my uh, my father, brother, all my friends. I, I'm deeply involved in the... In, um, in this idea of Ukraine become, uh, to become a European state, so it's hard. But I learn um, how to balance um, uh, my professional stand and, and my, personal st my personal feelings because I've been through a lot of uh, personal hardship in the past and I 
I, I know how to kind of kind of divide and, divide and make this two. make this in, like two and be uh, be professional in that regard. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Miroslava Gungadze from Viewers Ukrainian Service. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much thank for you. for coming on. Well, we are taking a break. On the other side, we'll hear what a prominent political voice in the U.S. has to say about American troops in Afghanistan. You're watching on assignment. In his last weeks in office, Afghan President Hamid Karzai has had some tough words for the United States. And the White House has made clear its displeasure with Mr. Karzai's comments, as well as his refusal to sign a bilateral security agreement. The BSA spells out the scope of a continued U.S. presence in Afghanistan. One politician who's been involved with Afghanistan from the beginning is, of course, U.S. Senator John McCain. Reporter Najiba Salam from VOA's Dari Service spoke with him about relations between Washington and Kabul. Take a listen. I'm, I'm very sad, not even angry, that President Karzai has behaved the way he has. I make no excuses for him. I wish he'd been much better. But there is some rationale for some of his behavior. I first met President Karzai in 2001 when Bagram had fallen from the, out of Taliban hands. And I've known him many, many times over the intervening years. And I've always had a very good relationship with him. The last election of 2009, he believed that the United States was trying to manipulate it to his detriment in that. So um, uh, I've seen President Karzai become more and more, uh, in my view, irrational. But there has been a basis for that irrational behavior. Najib Salam, in your interview, Senator McCain uh, used the word irrational. Mm -hmm. to describe President Karzai. What do you think he meant by that? Um, well, um, he, he knows that um, Afghanistan uh, needs uh, pre um, U, um, U.S. presence in Afghanistan. Um, and the, um, Afghanistan is not ready uh, for a U.S. to uh, withdraw completely from um, Afghanistan. So uh, for President Karzai, he's actually um, looking for his uh, legacy, for his future, and her, for, for his family. And, and that's why he's not signing, he's being, um, he's, um, Senator McCain says that he's irrational by not signing the bilateral security agreement. And yet Senator McCain seemed to also, as well as using this word irrational, mm -hmm. um, he also seemed to be maybe making some apologies almost for President Karzai and some of his actions. It, it seemed as though the senator was really of two minds uh, on this issue. Was I reading that right? That was exactly, um, I felt that uh, that's how it was. He said on one hand, um, you know, we want him to sign the BSA, but we're not giving him exactly how many troops we're gonna, is gonna stay back and, uh, and exactly with details what would be their um, mission. So that really, you know, aggravates him. And, and Senator McCain says that he has a, reason to be upset, to be irrational. As time passes, by necessity, because of the complexities of planning uh, withdrawal, and it's not just troops, we're talking about equipment and closing of bases, uh, that uh, the mission beyond 2014, should a BSA be signed, would by necessity, if it happens late in the year, be smaller in scale and ambition. I, I don't believe that if you tell the enemy again, as the president continues to do, that you are leaving that it is worthwhile staying for a short period of time. We need a long-term presence, not Americans in combat, without American casualties, that we need a long-term presence, just as we've had in Korea, Japan, other countries around the world. Do you think Afghans want a long-term U.S. presence in Afghanistan? Uh, for as long as they need. I, I believe a lot of right now there is a lot of concerns among the um, uh, civil societies, among women especially, they are really concerned that, you know, if Af uh, United States leave Afghanistan, the same thing will happen. Taliban will come and take over, insurgency will, you know, rise. And then that's why a lot of people, and especially um, Senator McCain mentioned about these 11 uh, presidential candidates, 
that he watched actually the televised uh, debate that they had, that he was so happy to, to hear from them that each one of them says that we will uh, sign the bilateral security agreement and we want uh, the need of the um, uh, United States for a long time. Do the Afghan forces and Afghan leadership adequately trust the U.S. forces and leadership, do you think? Um, that's another, that's, uh, I'm not quite sure about that, but I know for sure that they definitely need assistance. They definitely need that um, uh, use assistance as far as, um, you know, uh, monetary assistance, as far as any kind of training assistance, um, they, they need that. They, they will not, I mean, as if you ask any Afghan whether Afghan security forces are ready to defend their country, they will tell you no. That was VOA Dari Service reporter Najib Salam talking with Honest Simon's Doug Bernard. Afghanistan's April election could be historic, paving the way for the country's first ever peaceful democratic transfer of power. Well, moving on to another story of global interest, climate change. It's making it harder than usual for scientists to know what the future holds and the effect weather changes will have on societies and economies. Extreme weather events have destroyed homes and businesses around the world, but as VOS Jim Randall told on assignments Philip Alexio, U.S. builders and insurance companies say some simple changes can reduce the toll. In this laboratory test, a house built with conventional techniques is falling apart in hurricane force winds. The survivor has stronger shingles thicker roof boards and metal straps holding floors together. In the video that we saw where the one house is blowing away, you speak of these as labs, but these are real life size labs? They're, 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 those are, they basically built two complete houses. Okay, okay. life size one is some, One of them, is, and using normal uh, construction techniques, and one of them was used all the normal construction techniques, and they reinforced it with some straps and some stronger wood in key places. And then they turned on the fans at, uh, at a little more than hurricane strength, and that one house just, just flew apart. Well, uh, because when you're watching it, you just see sort of these minor little changes that don't look like it would be very expensive to reinforce a house. That's that the whole point. I mean, that's the whole point they're trying to make, is that if you do it, you know, with, with great care and figure out exactly where to put reinforcement and just how much. For example, the, the roof, uh, uh, the plywood on the roof of the reinforced house is a couple millimeters thicker than the, than the one that just fell apart. So it's clear that, that a certain amount of, uh, of reinforcement here and a little bit there and a little bit these other places makes a big difference. The growing number of unusually strong storms like Typhoon Haiyan has convinced the chairman of the U.S. Senate Homeland Security Committee, Tom Carper, uh, that extreme first, uh, weather is the new like norm. This. Now, you mentioned Typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines, and very destructive. And so when you look at a country like the Philippines that absorbs such an enormous disaster, do they suddenly start thinking, gee, you know, we got to do something about preparing for these types of things? Well, it's certainly, they, it's, it's pretty obvious that stronger houses w might have saved some lives. Uh, now, would it be strong enough to hold up to what is one of the few worst in, in history is a, is a question not beyond, uh, a question I can't answer, Maybe, perhaps scientists could, but it's clear that uh, you could do more to, to, to uh, save lives. Now, what about the models when you start trying to forecast, I guess, the economic damage? They can forecast they, they try to forecast the weather, basically, but they can find the out ways and they, to and deal with it. But it's really, it's apparently very difficult. I mean, it's difficult to forecast what's going to happen uh, with climate, but how fast and what impact, in this professor's view, was simply too hard to predict. I think all we can do is, taking all of that into account, come up with some very rough numbers, very rough estimates, I would say consensus estimates that maybe experts provide that give us a view of what would the catastrophic outcome look like if we don't do anything. Now the other thing I want to bring up is that he also talks about at least one action was that uh, you said in your report is maybe imposing a tax on carbon dioxide emissions that would maybe encourage companies and families to use less energy and to generate fewer gases. But if, Indi if Indonesia and China were not to adopt something like that, that's really moot and almost well, it's, it's doesn't make sense. It's one of the few things that we could actually do. Oh. And 
we're, if not the largest emitter of carbon dioxide, we're in the top two or three. And so, and the other thing is the United States, according to the people who support this, this sort of thing, we could show leadership. And our thanks, of course, to VOA's Jim Randall. Now, about half the world's population lives in cities, and it's those cities that account for more than 70% of global carbon dioxide emissions. We're taking a break now, but coming up, we get the blues. The music, that is, not the sadness. You're watching On Assignment. In the early 1900s, African Americans in the southern United States created a sound that came to be called the blues. Derived from spiritual chants and work songs in the fields, blues music nowadays is everywhere. It really is, and the blues is a style and tradition that has fans and players now not just in the United States, but around the world. In a series of reports, VMA's Houston-based correspondent Greg Flakis looked into the history of the music genre, and he talked to me about what he found. The blues was first played by African Americans in places like the Mississippi River Delta, south of Memphis. A lot of music that we hear that we would say, oh, that's the blues, doesn't necessarily fit in that category of musicology, or in terms of musicology, but uh, it's soulful, it, it expresses a feeling, and I think that's the basic thing that people would uh, identify. Eventually, it became mixed up with what was called jazz, where you had uh, instruments like uh, trumpets and uh, clarinets and saxophones and all. And sometimes those terms are, are very similar in terms of the music. But the blues has affected all kinds of music. Most of what we listen to today, rock and roll, country and western, all of that has been influenced by the blues. Now let's talk about the spread of blues music internationally because you talk about its origins being among African Americans in the American South. But now we're seeing people from all different places across the world playing blues. That's right. And in fact, some of the biggest fans are in Europe. At a time when the blues sort of went out of favor here in the United States, uh, British fans, for example, were collecting records. Right. And you featured some various blues singers across your reporting. Tell us about some of those, some of those singers and performers and maybe the stories that struck you most. Well, what I found was that in Houston, uh, where I'm based, there were a lot of clubs playing blues, and there were a lot of up-and-coming groups playing there. And when I started investigating this, I found out that actually Houston had quite a tradition of blues music. Uh, and of course, one of the most famous people was Lightning Hopkins, who lived most of his life in Houston and became world famous for his uh, style. And Ray Charles lived for a while in Houston. so. Uh, it was interesting to see how these younger people today are tapping into that heritage and keeping it alive and doing it in their own way. Eric Huvestal, who sings with the White Lightnings from Houston, is a fan of his city's most famous blues man, the late Lightning Hopkins. Houston blues with a lot of a lot of history, and Lightning Hopkins is definitely one of the forerunners. So I wanted to respect that, and so we named fan the White Lightnings in honor of Lightning Hopkins. Now you went to this international blues challenge. This has been going on for, for decades now. You went there in Memphis. Tell us about that experience. Well, yeah, what I did was I, I had gotten to know the blues players in uh, Houston who, who had been selected by the Houston Blues Society to go there. So I went there kind of following them to see what would happen. And when I got there, I found all kinds of other interesting groups as well. Artists from 40 U.S. states and 16 foreign countries came to the contest on Beale Street, where the blues has been played for more than a century. Deputy Director of the Blues Foundation, Joe Whitmer, says many musicians feel rewarded just performing here. Sure, they come and compete. Sure, they can walk away with prizes. But having the opportunity to come and play at least two nights on world-famous historic Beale Street uh, means the world to them. One of the major aspects of your reporting, you did a story on women and the blues, and that's a very interesting history. Yes, because the women were among the, the well, in fact, they were the first recording artists in terms of um, blues hits, Ma Rainey, for example. Uh, but over the years, men came to dominate it, and today, most blues groups uh, are either men or they might have one female. So uh, some of the female players uh, have 
taken to the fore and are trying to you know, find more of a niche for themselves and promote themselves more. We often have to fight harder to get the same respect of the guys, so you know, we have to bring it. We have to bring it harder, we have to bring in more. We bring in every bit of fire, passion, and soul we've got. What do you hope people take away from this series? Well, I think uh, there are two things. One would be that this is a music that came from America. This, the roots are here in our own country, and we should really be proud of that and celebrate it. The other thing is that the international aspect, the fact that this kind of music speaks to people in other cultures, in other countries, that there's something there that resonates with them. The blues seems to be universal. It seems to touch people in, uh, in many different countries in many different uh, areas of the world. And again, that was VOA's Greg Flakus. You know, Greg actually dabbles in some harmonica playing himself, and you are also a musician, so maybe you'll sing us a few blues notes? I, I love the blues. If I start singing right now, the show is going to end, and I'll just keep singing. But I'd love to jam with Greg and with our EP, Martin Seacrest. Okay, so one day, we we'll get will. a little clip of you, maybe sing for Facebook. Blues, yeah. All right, all right. Well, another popular form of entertainment, in addition to music, is horseback riding. At a farm in the U.S. state of Maryland, some people with disabilities are riding horses as a form of occupational therapy. Viewers, Arash Arabasadi spent a day at the farm to see it firsthand. Check it out. Today is the best day of the week. Before we even leave home, it's an expectation. It's Saturday, we're going horseback riding. This is Maryland Therapeutic Riding, a place where horses and therapists help people with special needs, like Selena. I come here for many reasons. Main reason is therapeutic, to get my core strength and balance and trunk control up to snuff. More monkeys jumping on the hair. Lily has lost the ability, her speech ability. She's gone from 500 words when she was five years old to a couple of words today. It's so exciting for me to see his growth and the changes, and I feel like it's open doors um, that wouldn't have been open without this program. In patients with difficulty walking, the movement on horseback simulates walking and stimulates core muscles. Therapist Deborah Taylor. The benefit is many fold because not only are you working on fine motor, you're doing it on the horse while it's moving in uncomfortable positions. That uncomfortable position forces riders to engage seldom used muscle groups. The results are inspirational. Executive Director Ken McCready. The things that you see here are, are, are miraculous. Uh, they're just little miracles every day that happen uh, in people's lives. And you see it on the riders' faces uh, and, and what they're able to achieve or what they're able to learn, the fun they're having. And that's the trick, having therapy disguised as fun. A lot of these participants can't do other sports. They can't play soccer. They can't play basketball. They can't do a team sport. These three are as different as their special needs. And while this time on a horse doesn't cure them, it brings joy. And for a few hours on Saturday, the rhythms of normality blend into the gait of a horse. Aras Arabasadi for VOA News. And sadly, that's all the time we have for today. Join us next week when our national reporter looks ahead to the 2016 U.S. presidential election and the odds that Hillary Clinton will be the Democratic nominee. Yeah, and then we'll also be hearing from our Islamabad correspondent about a disturbing kind of attack that is happening all too often in Pakistan. Be sure to watch On Assignment online on VOANews.com. Facebook and YouTube. And remember, VOA is the place for international news coverage every hour of every day. Thanks so much for watching. We look forward to having you with us again next week.